end of the presentation, as usual, we're going to invite you all to take a picture. So please stay for the picture. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, today, I will present part of my master thesis work. The title is Bioclimatic and Structural Predictors of Phenology in the Paraguayan Dry Chaco Forest. Um, I will give a general overview of the dry chaco, um, some terms, the methods, hypothesis, and some preliminary results of my work. Um, in the upper part of this slide, you can see a picture of the forest canopy of, uh, of the Chaco, uh, which it might be different from what people usually think about when they hear um, dry forest. So it is closed. Um, it has many levels. And it is very green, especially in the growing season. And of course, it is beautiful. <laughs> so, um, the Gran Chaco Americano is, the, is one of the largest biomes in South America. Um, it is one of, it is the largest um, continuous remnant of dry forest in the world. And in South America, it is the second largest continuous forest remnant um, after uh, the Amazon. Um, it is shared between Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay, as you, as you can see in the map. And in the lower part, you also can see that um, it has an um, almost central geographical um, location in the continent. The, right, the Chaco uh, is characterized as a seropitic semi deciduous forest, which means that it is adapted to the to drought periods and uh, it loses part of their leaves uh, during the dry season. It provides habitat to several communities, uh, provides habitat to animals, reptiles, birds, and it is um, a stopover for migratory birds, especially in the um, moister areas that for example, we can see dirt. Um, over the, the past uh, few years, the Chaco has faced a major problem on deforestation, tree cover loss, and land use change. Here, uh, you can see a Global Forest Watch screenshot of the tree cover loss um, between 2001 and 2018. In the black polygon, you can see the area covered by the Chaco. And between the years 2001 and 2010, the highest 80% of the land use change in South America and the Caribbean uh, was in lands um, from Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Brazil. Being the Chaco, the area with the highest deforestation and in dry uh, woodlands. As you may see in the northeastern part of the Chaco here, uh, there is a very big uh, difference in, like, you can see that it has lost a lot of forest and that is an area that belongs to Paraguay. So the main drivers of this um, land use change and deforestation are land clearings for um, grasslands and croplands. This is a map of a, a figure from a paper on habitat loss and fragmentation of the Jaguar. Uh, in the big green map, you can see um, the drivers of this land use change. In the southern area, uh, which has a um, lighter color, you can see that the main driver of land use change was croplands. Uh, this is for soybeans. And in the upper area, the, uh, the area that belongs to Paraguay, it 
the main driver is grasslands for cattle ranching. This difference is mainly because there, there were no soybeans, uh, drought resistant soybeans variety available in Paraguay. However, uh, last year in November, uh, they became available. So probably this uh, map will change shortly. So um, in a more local way, 60% um, of the Paraguayan territory um, is occupied by, by the Chaco. At the same time, this consists, consists of the 25% of the overall um, Gran Chaco. In, in Paraguay, the Chaco is divided into dry Chaco and humid Chaco. Um, this is a, a classification based on the precipitation of the areas. And this, um, the Chaco neighbors with other ecoregions such as the Pantanal, the Cerrado, and the Atlantic Forest. Um, some, um, due to global, such global and local factors, um, Paraguay has experienced a rapid economic growth at the expense of the um, ecological stability. So, um, with a rise in global food demand and low land price, also weak policy and the high availability of natural resources, um, we can see um, that like Paraguay has become uh, one of the countries with the highest deforestation rates worldwide. In this um, image from the NASA Earth Observatory uh, from 2018, we can see the deforestation pattern in the in the Paraguayan Chaco, which um, differs from the typical fish bone pattern in other eco in other regions. So here you can see that the lands, the cleared lands, are very geometrical and in the shapes of rectangles and squares for cattle ranching. Uh, having this context and then. Um, of a rapid forest loss and habitat fragmentation, plus the um, um, prevailing trends of climate change, uh, there is a need of understanding um, how these forests might respond uh, with these uh, trends. Um, in this context, uh, phenology, meaning the um, natural life cycles of living organisms and talking about forest phenology i am referring to um leaf, greenness of leaves fruits and production of fruits uh, of flowers and also the seriousness of of leaves um this will provide this provides um an important overall information for the whole ecosystem and eco, uh, ecosystem ecological uh, process. Phenology is highly, highly responsive to climate variables and it is also responsive to fragmentation and other kinds of disturbances. And forest phenology also shapes the life cycles of the living organisms within those forests, for example, uh, through herbivory, and um, at the same time, forest phenology um, regulates um, biochemical cycles such as the water cycle or soil nutrient cycle. There is a strong, there is a strong evidence uh, regarding the relationship between phenology and climate variables, being temperature and precipitation the most well-documented ones. However, how um, factors outside climate shape the phenological, the phenological events of forests, um, it's not well understood. Um, in this context, above ground biomass, uh, meaning the living material of trees that is above the soil, um, might provide a might explain some of the um, 
interactions between climate and structure. But the study of phenology and is hampered by the need of very long-term uh, monitoring. That, in, that is why um, remote sensing uh, might play a key role in, um, in getting the data we need to, to perform this kind of studies in a long term. So for my research, um, I, am, I am using three main sources of information. The first one is our forest inventories from a permanent plot network that gives me uh, information regarding the forest structure of, of my study sites. I am using high resolution planet scope imagery. Uh, this provides information on the phenological stage of forest and high resolution world clean bioclimatic data which provides, of course, um, information regarding precipitation, temperature, and other uh, climatic variables that might explain uh, the phenomena. I will talk a little bit more about them um, later in this presentation. So uh, with my study, I want to relate vegetative phenological stages of the dry chaco forest and bioclimatic conditions. Vegetative phenological stages refer to the um, stage of the forest where the main uh, metabolic uh, activity is to produce uh, green leaves to increase their photosynthetic activity. So I am not talking about flowers or fruits. I also want to uh, identify the influence of forest structure in those uh, phenological stages. I hypothesize that precipitation will be the most important bioclimatic factor to predict phenology since this is a dry forest. Um, and that phenology is positively correlated to the and structural parameters of AGB height and stem density, and that species diversity re reduce, re results in reduced seasonal phenological um, variability. So um, about the structure data, I am using um, forest inventory data from a permanent work and permanent plot network from Paraguay. Um, it has uh, 43 plots in different ecoregions of the country. However, I, will, I am using only the nine plots that are located in the dry Chaco area. Each plot, plot has one hectare of area and all the trees with 10 centimeters of diameter are measured. Um, the information from these uh, inventories are species and DVH, uh, height, and the phenological stage at the moment of the measurement uh, for uh, the tree's health and the spatial uh, location of, it, of each of the trees. With this field data, I can derive information about species composition, meaning which species are are present are present in the for in the plots which ones are are dominant or which ones are not dominant. I can uh, derive the stem density, meaning how many trees per hectare are there, and I can use the um, structural measurements to estimate the above ground biomass. Uh, the above ground ground biomass is estimated with allometric equations. These equations um, provide a measure of how much biomass each tree has. And by summing this, we know how much biomass there is in the plant. So I am using the Chave equation that relates diameter, wood density, and height. And this is a general model for dry forest. And um, I am using the Sato equation 
that was developed in Paraguay in the dry channel. And it um, uh, uses diameter and height. For the satellite imagery, I am using high resolution planet scope uh, images. This is a constellation of micro satellites uh, that provide images at three meter resolution. Um, they have high frequency revisit, you, uh, usually several times, more than once a week or even daily. Uh, these images have four bands, red, blue, and green, which are the visible light, and the infrared, uh, and, and an infrared light. Um, with the red and near infrared band, I can calculate the normalized difference vegetation index, um, which is a relation between the red and near infrared bands. This um, is based on the natural um, response of the leaf of the trees when where they absorb more of the red light and, and, and reflect the infrared when they are um, very green, healthy. <laughs> and so meaning that when the forest is in a growing season with a high photosynthetic activity, the NDVI um, should reflect the the trees should reflect more uh, near infrared light. To do this, I use a, a GIS analysis software, Envy, and um, here you can see an example of how the image changes once you uh, calculate the NDVI. The areas that have a dense, more dense forest or that have more green um, areas reflect more light, so they are whiter here. Finally, um, I have the World Clean data sets. These are um, a set of worldwide layers of temperature, precipitation, radiation, and other bioclimatic variables uh, that are usually um, applied for maps or for species um, models. Uh, with, I use uh, ArcGIS Pro to extract the values of mean precipitation, mean temperature, and the bioclimatic very layers uh, that are different measurements of precipitation and temperature. Um, so, um, where did all this da data brand me? <laughs> Here you can see. <laughs> so, um, the, the orange uh, line uh, corresponds to the NDVI, but please keep in mind that um, I multiplied the NDVI by 10 for visualization objectives. Usually the NDVI values um, are between minus one and plus one. The, the blue line uh, presents the precipitation and the red line presents the temperature. So in the dry charcoal, usually the dry season starts with the the rainy season starts between November and December and extends until March, um, which we can see in the, in the blue line. Also, uh, June, July, and August are the coldest uh, months and also the driest months. Uh, we can see all this trend in the red, la red line as well. In general, and we can see a similar behavior of the NDVI lines with the other, uh, with the climatic variables, uh, with the exception of plot number four. Uh, so to 
gain a deeper understanding of the, this relationship between NDVI and climate. Um, here we have a scatter plot of the NDVI values and precipitation and temperature uh, with a fitted uh, linear, with a fitted line. So for both um, variables, um, I got a significant p-value. However, as you may see, the points are too scattered around the line, which means uh, that they uh, explain, uh, that do not explain too much the variation. So I need, uh, I would need to include other variables or maybe transform this data uh, to obtain a better um, explanation power. <laughs> um, so at this point, I, I, I related the NDVI with the, the, with the climatic variable. And I, I found that even that precipitation and temperature are both significant in an, and there is not a lot of difference between them. So my next step was to um, identify if um, this, how the NDVI relates to the structural characteristics of the forest. So um, in the upper left uh, pane, we have the stem density. What, then we have the diameter. Here there is the uh, height, mean height and the biomass um, estimation. Uh, I was expecting to find a positive correlation between all of these variables with NDVI. However, I only found a positive correlation between stem density, meaning the number of trees, each plot, and height. Uh, diameter and both measurements of biomass uh, had a negative Correlation. So, <laughs> with this uh, result, I am I am planning to try a stepwise stepwise analysis of models predicting NDVI. Um, I will need to probably need to transform my data since I am working with with climate data and they don't have a parametric distribution. Um, then I need to detect the phenological variability in terms of growing season length. In the, in the line graph that I show you, we can see the trends of when the NDVI was high and low. Um, but we don't know exactly when did that growing season, growing season start or end. And once I have that data, um, I would like, I, I, I am planning to identify the relationship with the compositional vari vari variable. Um, so with this um, research, um, I am planning to, I expect to provide a basis for understanding how the forest in the dry chapel are going to respond to the climate change, to climate change and to the fragmentation um, issues uh, that are prevailing in the region. Um, I would also, I, I, I also want to provide um, um, like a, a not like a, a base for starting more more deep phenological studies that relate the forest phenology with animals or other organisms phenology. And, and I hope that with this research um, we can predict better the biomass dynamics of the dry forest, which will be crucial for, for biodiversity and for carbon storage in, in the future. So um, this is my this was the presentation and thank you very much.